What's up everyone? Big Sky Bowler coming to you again from Town & Country Lanes and today we are going to discuss best lane play strategies for two-handed bowlers. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the channel everyone. To begin the discussion about lane play, really, we need to first discuss the differences between bowling ball cores and surfaces. Let's start with the easiest of these two subjects and discuss ball surface. We will start with the easiest ball surface, which is plastic, also referred to as polyester. Now, the majority of your house bowling balls are made of plastic. Some houses also have urethane house balls. These bowling balls were most popular in the late 70s with the most popular plastic balls being the white dot and the yellow dot, manufactured by Columbia 300. This ball surface is the hardest type of bowling ball and usually speaking does not come with a core inside the ball. Because the ball has the hardest surface on top of not including a core, this type of surface tends to skid the farthest down the lane and is therefore used mainly as a spare ball, but not always. Next, we have urethane. This here is my own personal urethane, my big bro burnup. Urethane is the softest ball surface currently available. This type of cover stock was very popular during the 80s as it gave the bowlers the ability to move left and generate more entry angle into the pocket, thus producing higher scores. The first urethane balls did not come with a core inside the ball and instead featured the pancake weight block just like plastic balls had. Because of the addition of the urethane cover, however, this allowed the ball to grip the lane and generate more hook than a plastic ball. We are karate, reading, golf, and gymnastics. Lane, John Petraglia. Sooner or later, right? 4 7. Brush the foul line, just let the ball get away from. Leaves a 4 7 cutting through very sharply, almost breaks it down. Look at this pin come across, almost knocks out the 4 and the 7. Doesn't get the 7. Petraglia will go for it. Urethane was popular until about 1990 to 1991, when reactive resin made its appearance. This type of cover stock seemed to be rather sticky and gripped lane much better than anything on the market. The gripping power of this cover gave the bowler increased hooking capability and more energy and hitting power at the pins to create a wider strike pocket. It was rumored that with these types of balls, you no longer needed to be as accurate as you had to with a plastic ball or a urethane ball. All you needed to do was really bowl in the vicinity of your intended target. The creation of this new cover stock material led to several different subtypes, and this is where we get solid reactive, which is what I have here, pro reactive, which I have one in my bag, and hybrid reactive, which personally, I don't do any hybrids. This gives us a total of three different cover stocks with very different characteristics from each other. Plastic is the hardest type of cover, grips the lane the least, offering the most skid. Urethane is the softest cover type and grips the lane the most, offering the least skid. Reactive resin takes the best of both worlds and offers the grip of a urethane ball, and due to the resin additives in the cover, along with the newer core technology, allows the ball to flip harder when it encounters friction on the lane. In the early days, bowling balls were quite simple. You had a plastic cover wrapped around a completely spherical shaped core made of very dense material. As the ball technology was further developed, manufacturers began to experiment with different core shapes. The most basic of these experiments was adding a weight block to the spherical core. This weight block was added only to one side of the core near the ball's surface. This provided a bit of imbalance in the ball, which when acted upon by gravity would allow the ball to generate rotation. The added rotation the ball gained increased scores greatly for players. When the first reactive resin ball hit the market, core technology had developed much farther and ball cores began to take on all kinds of various shapes and sizes. And today we have basically two main types of cores that most balls are released with. The first core type we're going to discuss is the symmetrical core. Symmetrical cores are the most stable type of core and they provide the most balance outside of a ball without a core. If you were to take a knife and cut a symmetrical core in half from top to bottom and compare the two sides, they would both hold the exact same shape. The next type of core that we are going to discuss is asymmetrical cores. 
asymmetrical cores are the most unstable type of core and they provide the most imbalance. If you were to take a knife and cut the core from top to bottom and compare the two sides, they would both look entirely different from one another. Now, both types of these cores have their own unique characteristics, but can be easily broken down into three categories. Low RG, which is a ball that contains an RG number between 2.45 to 6 to 2.50 to 2.51. Medium RG, which is an RG number of 252 to 256. And then high RG, which is a number between 257 and 2.8. Low RG cores take the mass of the core and place it near the center of the ball. This causes the ball to rev up extremely quickly, which also causes the ball to hook the earliest on the lane. Medium RG cores take the mass of the core and they place it near the middle of the ball. This causes the ball to delay its rev up and causes the ball to hook later on the lane, more in the middle part of the lane. High RG cores take the mass of the core and they place it closer to the outside of the ball near the cover stock. This delays the ability to rev up, which also delays the hook of the ball. Each category of core characteristic also has its own maximum flare potential controlled by the difference between the X axis and the Y axis of the ball. This is referred to as the ball's differential and again comes with three categories. Low differential, which is a ball containing a differential between 0.000 to 0.025. Medium differential, which is a ball containing a differential between 0 0.026 and 0 0.046. And then you have high differential, which is a ball with a differential between 0 0.047 and 0 0.060. Low differential balls have the least flare potential, which means that as the ball rotates down the lane, there is less fresh cover stock touching the lane surface. The ball is essentially rotating around a part of the cover stock that has already contacted the lane's surface and is therefore covered in oil. This helps the ball create additional length down the lane. High differential balls have the most flare potential, which means as the ball rotates around its circumference, more fresh surface of the cover is touching the lane. The ball is so imbalanced that as it rotates, it rotates off of its initial track and a fresh part of the cover that has not touched the lane yet meets the lane, creating more friction, and this causes the ball to hook earlier. Now, you may be asking yourself, why does this information matter to me when it comes to lane play? The answer, because if we understand what a ball is supposed to do based upon its combination of cover and core, then we can understand when it is best to be used on the lane. If we understand when it is best to use a specific ball, then we can reduce the amount of guesswork required to perform better, especially on tougher conditions. For example, let's look at my arsenal here. I currently have an eight ball arsenal consisting of six reactive resin balls, a urethane ball, and a spare ball. I have three symmetrical balls and four asymmetrical balls. In each bag, I have a low RG ball, a medium RG ball, and a an high RG ball to help balance out my entire arsenal. My symmetrical bag actually includes two low RG balls with two entirely different layouts to give me two entirely different looks at the breakpoint. As far as ball differentials, they vary a little bit from each other, but I usually control my ball flare potential with the layout I place on the ball by adjusting my pin to PAP distances. Now you may be asking yourself, how do I apply this knowledge? The answer, first we need to know what we are bowling on. Most tournaments will post the pattern that you will be bowling on before you bowl on it. If it's a PBA tournament, you will know the pattern several weeks leading up to the tournament. If it is an amateur style tournament, usually you will not know the pattern until the day before or the day of your qualifying. There are three main things we want to look for when we look at a pattern sheet. Pattern length, pattern volume, and pattern ratio. These three criteria will dictate the type of ball that will work best on the pattern. If you are bowling on a pattern that is quite long, let's say 43 feet or longer, it is not in your best interest to throw a ball with low RG that will rev up super early. The ball will lose energy too quickly and when it gets to the break point, it will have nothing left to turn the corner and hit the pocket enough to carry a strike. In that particular case, you'll definitely want to go with a ball that has a higher RG but also has a decent flare potential differential number. What this will do is it will allow the ball to get the length it needs down the lane but also allow the ball to hook enough to make the corner at the end of the pattern. 
Combine this with keeping the ball a little bit closer to the head pin as it exits the pattern, and you should have some success. If you are bowling on a pattern that is quite short, let's say 37 feet or shorter, it is not in your best interest to throw a ball that has a very high RG that will rev up super late. This ball will definitely get the length that you're looking for, but it will become very uncontrollable at the break point as it's retaining the maximum amount of energy potential. Combine this with keeping the ball away from the pocket by ensuring that the ball exits the pattern further away from the head pin. Essentially, you will need to play closer to the gutter. If you are bowling on a pattern that is very oil soaked, it is usually best to use a ball with low RG that revs up early and has a high flare potential. This causes the ball to hook the most in the thick of the oil and give you a reaction. It is usually best to combine this with a lot of surface on your ball to help the ball maintain its grip on the lane. If you are bowling on a pattern that is very dry, it is usually best to use a ball with a high RG that revs up later and has a low flare potential or a low differential number. This causes the ball to get the length you need through the front part of the lane and when it gets to the break point it's going to give you a very smooth shape into the pocket. It is usually best to combine this with less surface on your ball to help the ball get through the dry area of the lane. As a two-handed player, we generally deal with a very high rev rate but not enough speed to match that rev rate. This makes us a rev dominant player. Therefore, you will see many two-handed bowlers going with a urethane bowling ball that gives them the maximum control over the pattern, something that will not overreact on the dry back end, especially when the pattern is fresh. The downside to using urethane all the time is that eventually the ball will lose its ability to carry a strike due to the nature of the way the ball works. Not only does the ball hook very early, but it also carries oil with it through to the break point and because it does not have the reactive resin additive in the cover, when it encounters friction, its motion to the pocket is generally very smooth. Now this is great on shorter patterns or when the back end of the lane is very fresh, but not so great as the pattern breaks down or on longer oil patterns. On the reactive side, I believe it is best for two-handers to use equipment that is medium to high RG. These balls will get down the lane farther and when combined with proper ball surface, it will create a very controlled reaction. Keep in mind, it is still a good idea to carry at least a couple of low RG balls with you just in case. Personally, I carry three, two symmetrical and one asymmetrical. In all cases, when you are faced with a difficult pattern, you always want to start with the ball that you are the most familiar with, whether this is your urethane ball or whether this is a solid reactive ball on the asymmetric or the symmetrical side or a pearl reactive ball, it really doesn't matter as long as you are very familiar with the reaction that ball is going to give you. This ball was called your benchmark ball and it will give you a read on how the pattern is playing and it will also give you an indication of whether you need to ball up to a stronger ball for a smoother shape at the break point or ball down to a weaker ball that will give you a sharper reaction at the break point. If your benchmark ball reacts too much at the break point, try balling down to a weaker ball. If it still reacts too much at the break point, try some surface on the weaker ball to see if it will tame it down a little bit. If your benchmark ball does not react enough at the break point, try balling up to a stronger ball. If it still does not react enough for you, try some surface on the stronger ball to see if it gives you the reaction you're looking for. All right, guys, thanks for watching the video today. If this helped you understand lane play better than you did before, please consider subscribing to the channel. As always, please click the like button and don't forget to turn on your notifications by clicking the bell. I will see you guys in the next video.